and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Welcome to the College of Letters and Sciences Annual Humanities Lecture Series. Every semester, we provide three presentations on a humanities-related topic of interest to the community. Please note that all of our presentations are educational, free, and open to the public, and are set for the evening hours so that everyone can attend. Please let your families, friends, and colleagues know about the program so that they can join us. The Humanities Lecture Series, as well as ASU Project Humanities, are part of a university-wide initiative that promotes the importance of the humanities in our lives and in education, the overall development of the individual, and the engagement between community and institutions of knowledge. I would like to take a few minutes to thank all those who make the series possible, from our communications team, to our dean and school director, to Barbara, Dr. Barbara Leffer, the humanities unit head, Dr. Neil Lester, project humanities director, and last but not least, special thanks to our technology team, headed by Mr. Peter Blafford. Our program will commence with the presentation, then we will open the floor to a Q&A period. Please keep your comments short and to the point so that as many people can uh, speak up. Finally, please feel free to grab a flyer that highlights what is coming in our fall program. Now to turn to our esteemed guest, Mr. Paul C. Steffi is a Vietnam veteran that, who served in the U.S. 9th Infantry Division from October 1967 to October 68. He believes that his work has meaning and significance to uh, war veterans and their families. He writes to explain and make sense to himself and others what he experienced in Vietnam as a young 18-year-old. He believes and accepts that freedom does come with a price, but he asks, why do so many combat service members and their families pay a price for the rest of their lives? Mr. Steffi enjoys writing and likes to share his stories with interested, informed readers. He is the author of several um, novels and uh, fiction stories, as well as novelettes. He enjoys flying, travel, wildlife photography, hiking, oceans, forests, and so much more. Although an avid world traveler, he and his family call the Southwest, and specifically Sedona, home. So please join me in giving Mr. Steffi a very warm welcome. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. Not long ago, it would have been impossible for me to tell you my story. My grief was still too real, and it's still not easy for me even now. So let me begin with these perceptive words of Plato, who wrote them over 2,400 years ago. His thoughts and his ability to distill concepts and ideas were phenomenal. He lived into his 80th year. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Improvements in weaponry have flourished. But has anything in this crazy world changed to alter this sad fact? No. Human nature has not changed. Specific dates are important in our lives. A date I will never forget is January 13th, 1968. I was in B Company, 2nd Battalion, 47th Infantry, 9th Infantry Division. We were 40 miles south of Saigon, somewhere in the jungle. We walked single file in the hot sun back to our base camp. That evening, that morning, we'd flown out in helicopters to assist another unit. The Viet Cong enemy, the VC, had ambushed them the night before. Their losses, six killed and 14 wounded. We arrived at their remote location and helped the wounded into medevac helicopters. Next, the dead in their body bags went into two helicopters destined for the military morgue. 
otherwise known as Graves Registration in Saigon. When finished, we ate sea rations for lunch. Then we departed on our long walk. After our first hour on the trail, to include a 10 minute break, we walked another half hour and the jungle environment quickly became tall grasses. Each hour was 60 minutes, but it seemed a lot longer. The long narrow blades of tall grass were higher than our heads on both sides of the trail. Visibility was seldom beyond 10 to 15 feet. The temperature was 90 degrees and the humidity was oppressive. We were soaked in sweat and we each carried 60 pounds of guns and ammo, hand grenades, and various other equipment. Two canteens per man sloshed their hot, flat tasting contents and all of this combined to keep us sweating profusely. Gnats, mosquitoes, and flies were thick in the sweltering sun in our corridor of tall grass. I walked into a low tree branch covered in tiny red ants. They swarmed over my face, neck, and arms, and they bit me incessantly. I thought I'd never get them off, but I did manage the task. The region of tall grass ended and visibility was, once again, mostly 50 to 75 feet all around. 100 yards directly to our front, on a slight hill ahead of us, we didn't see the VC who waited to ambush us. For several minutes, the shooting continued. Our numbers of wounded and dead increased. The VC were well hidden. We weren't. Our commanding officer used the radio and called for an airstrike. 20 minutes later, two Navy jets each dropped fragmentation bombs on the VC position. The shooting stopped. When it was over, all of us who could got up. We walked around the site to help the injured. <clears throat> this is the best photo of Michael I could find. I saw Michael, my friend. He sat leaning back, propped against a large tree. <clears throat> His helmet was upside down on the ground a few feet away. A medic must have put him there while he tried to help. Michael's eyes were closed. At first glance, he looked asleep. I walked beside him and knelt. I knew the truth. I'd never seen head wounds until then. They both were small, at least smaller than I expected them to be. The good news was, Michael never knew what hit him. Michael and I were both 18 years old, and we'd arrived a few weeks earlier. He was my first friend to die in Vietnam. A year later, another 26 brave young men I'd known had died. Some were friends, and several were acquaintances. Three were in my high school graduation class, but they weren't in my unit, and I didn't find out about them until much later. Here's how I came to be in Vietnam from October 1967 through October 1968. I'd graduated from high school when I was 17 years old, and I'd talked myself into an entry-level job with a telephone company in Indianapolis, Indiana. The building where I worked was 70 miles from my home in Terre Haute. For my first four months, the job and living in a large city was interesting. I didn't have a car, and on weekends, I'd ride the Greyhound bus home to Terre Haute, and on Friday evenings after work. I re then I'd return to my sleeping room on Sunday afternoon by bus. In those days, I stayed to myself in those years, and two months later, I couldn't take the monotony in my life any longer. I wanted to travel and have some adventures. I felt that I had big things waiting in my life. I wanted to get started. I decided to join the military. I knew I'd succeed in life, and so within a few days, I resigned my telephone company position. It was one of those jobs where one might remain an employee for 40 years. Then the retiree could enter into a comfortable retirement, perhaps live on Primrose Lane. However, for me, six months at this stage of my life was enough. When I told my parents I'd resigned, they were not pleased. In those days, 
military recruiters were located in a city's main post office. I went to the Air Force recruiter first, and he'd said, there's a six-month wait. Vietnam brings me lots of business. I went next door to the Navy recruiter, and he said, there's a four-month wait. I said, I know. I've heard about Vietnam. Then I went across the hall and down a few doors. When I asked my question to the Army recruiter, he smiled and said, I'll have you in basic training in three weeks. To that I <clears throat> responded, where do I sign? I talked with him for 20 minutes and took a few Army brochures. Three days later, I returned to his office. On that afternoon, I initialed the documents for me to join the Army. I signed up for the infantry and volunteered for Vietnam all in a matter of minutes. It was the second week of March, 1967. My parents were in shock, but it was a done deal. My dad had been severely injured in World War II, hence a reason for their apprehension. Three weeks later, I formally signed the paperwork at the induction station, and I took the oath with two dozen other enlistees and draftees. I finished basic training at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Then I went to infantry school. Mine was called Tigerland at Fort Polk, Louisiana. I finished the training and went home for 17 days. While I was on leave, I bought an airline ticket. My leave completed, I said goodbye to my parents and flew to Oakland, California. I took a taxi for a 20-minute ride to Oakland Army Base. It's located across the bay from San Francisco. Three days later, 9.30 p.m., three busloads of us rode to Travis Air Force Base near Sacramento, California. Our next flight at midnight was destined for Vietnam, with stops in Anchorage, Alaska, and Yokota, Japan. I arrived in Saigon at Tan Sanut Airport at 7.30 a.m. in late October 1967. I was 18 years old. Not once did I feel any fear that I'd be injured or killed in Vietnam. Americans were dying every day within the war zone, but I felt confident that nothing would happen to me. And in a physical sense, nothing did happen to me. However, I'd never heard of PTSD. Three days after I arrived at my unit, we departed Bearcat, our main base camp. Operation Santa Fe would be the longest stay that my battalion experienced in the jungle. 64 days of continuous field operations. Here I am at a typical, hastily prepared camp in the jungle. This was a photo op. I wasn't in a strictly ground unit. Troops and other units rode helicopters or in trucks for extended transportation. Our vehicles were called APCs, <clears throat> armored personnel carriers. Behind me is the equivalent of a tow truck for tanks. If an APC could not be repaired in the field, it was towed back to the main base camp with one of these or it was loaded onto a flatbed truck. This is a 155 millimeter self-propelled artillery piece. It could shoot a 100 pound projectile 11 miles. This is another and one of my favorite pictures. The vehicle in the background could attach itself to the bridge. The bridge would fold in half and then it was portable. The vehicle and the bridge together weighed 80 tons. In one four-month period, beginning in January 1968, my battalion had four consecutive commanders. The first, a lieutenant colonel, received a promotion. He went proudly to division headquarters. No guarantee of safety, but more prestige. Our second battalion commanding officer was with us for two brief weeks. Then one day, the colonel's pilot landed his Korean-era bubble helicopter. The colonel got out, and then, no one knows why, he walked into the spinning back blade. He lost his right arm, but miraculously, he survived. 
The third commanding officer was with us for about six weeks. Then, during the Tet Offensive, when VC and North Vietnamese units attacked dozens of cities and American bases in South Vietnam, he met his untimely fate. It happened in the outskirts of Saigon. Under cover of tall trees, several VC shot down his helicopter while it flew at low altitude. They'd released a fusillade of AK-47 rifle fire into the aircraft. On that fateful day, the colonel had invited two soldiers to ride along with him. They were both in their early 20s, married and I knew them. They worked in the radio repair section of headquarters company. The flight was supposed to be short and routine for observation and reconnaissance. Both of them had only one week remaining in Vietnam. Then they'd return to their families and, and have stateside duty. But in the end, neither man survived the flight. The Saigon River is wide and deep. This is the area where the colonel's helicopter went down. The stricken helicopter crashed and sank quickly into the murky waters of the Saigon River. Two hours later, Navy divers and a heavy-duty Chinook helicopter recovered the colonel's doomed craft. Once connected by a thick nylon strap, the powerful Chinook helicopter pulled the smaller aircraft out of the water then the pilot lowered it upon the narrow riverbank. The medics did their job. Three of the men, including the colonel, were still wearing their seat belts. Of the nine men on board, including the crew, only two had survived. The bodies of two of the men had disappeared in the swift river currents. Our commanding officer, 43-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Frederick Van Dusen, <clears throat> was General Westmoreland's brother-in-law. I still have the newspaper clipping my mother sent to me a month later. She'd clipped it from my hometown newspaper. I'd told her about the incident and it reaffirmed the danger that I was in all the time. Her first husband had died in World War II when his B-29 aircraft exploded soon after takeoff from Guam en route to Japan. To make matters worse for her, I'm an only child. Our fourth commanding officer was at his post for four months when I returned to the U.S. As far as I know, he survived his year in Vietnam. At least I hope he did. As the losses of those I knew piled up, my emotions felt hollow, empty, and numb. From my experiences, I had learned an important reality. I must stop getting to know new people in my unit because next week, tomorrow, or in 10 minutes, they might be dead. To appear manly, I told no one of my painful thoughts. Throughout my year in Vietnam, I shed not a single tear. I couldn't. For the past 47 years, my family didn't know what I'd seen, done, or experienced in Vietnam. I felt safe in keeping my secrets to myself. I didn't speak of my time in Vietnam to anyone. <clears throat> Many veterans did what I did. <clears throat> I avoided anything whatsoever to do with the military. I stayed away from parades where military bands marched and played. And I didn't attend military funerals or ceremonies where a bugler would play taps. I knew that tears would flow, and I didn't want to feel embarrassed. However, this year is different. I wrote my book about a soldier's war experiences on foreign soil. Although written as fiction, the story tells some of my own losses and the ensuing emotional devastation that I felt. And yes, the story does have an uplifting conclusion. My story takes place in 1967, 68, and in 2014. Although written as fiction, I do have the two paintings mentioned in the story, when an elderly villager gave the 18-year-old soldier her family keepsakes to share with the American people. 
these are the two paintings. They're up front on the table right here if you'd like to see them later. <clears throat> the soldier revisits Vietnam in 2014 with other veterans to ease his pain and to search for the woman's family and her village. What he finds changes his life. I took this photo when we walked past her village. I wrote the good soldier as much for myself and my family as I did for other veterans and their family. My message is clear. It's never too late to break free of the mental chains that hold you back and grab hold of the good life you once thought impossible. I've discovered that while writing, <clears throat> editing, and rereading this book many times, that, to a degree, I've changed for the better myself. I like the photo so much that I used it for my book cover. Hundreds of thousands of other American soldiers from Vietnam through more recent wars experience PTSD in varying degrees of severity. Some never lose the worst of their memories. For them, finding and building and keeping employment and living within a typical family unit is very difficult, if not impossible. Yet, for all of them, there is always hope. I wish my fellow service members to realize <clears throat> that if medications and available resources aren't enough, please don't give up. My book got off to a slow start. On some days, I'd sit and stare at the blank page or across the room and through the window. I'd look into the distance, then, with nothing on the page, I'd give up for the day. I'd get up, walk away, and do something else. Plenty of memories swirled in my mind, but during those unproductive times, I lost my ability to put words on paper. Finally, on one afternoon, something did happen, and my hesitation to write my story simply vanished. I'd let go enough to compose what became the opening sentences on page one. And here they are. It's 2.30 a.m. It happens every morning about this time, almost as regular as clockwork. As if on command, I sit up in bed, fully alert. Beads of sweat roll down my forehead <clears throat> while I stare into the darkness. The most terrible of my dreams are over. Until tomorrow, I felt glad and relieved at what I'd accomplished. I'd finally written my opening lines. The word count wasn't much, but it was a beginning. I continued to write more of my immediate thoughts on the yellow pad of lined paper, a few sentences at a time. I felt a bolt of emotional energy open a mental floodgate within me. Additional longer sentences appeared on the page, letter by letter, word by word. Short paragraphs on what had been blank pages emerged freely. Before I'd realized it, I'd written my first rough draft chapter. I'd actually finished several pages. A month later, I had a completed draft of my own Vietnam story. So what I did, so I did what came naturally. I stopped writing. I considered it complete. In the story, I haven't overlooked many of my immediate thoughts about Vietnam. I felt proud the day I had finished my first draft. And along the way, I'd filled a few handkerchiefs with tears. My story contains the essence of what has helped me in my quest for clearer, less painful memories, events that, <clears throat> that happened to me nearly 50 years ago. By publishing my book, I'm reaching out to as many other veterans as possible among the hundreds of thousands who continue in their own non-physical pain and suffering. <clears throat> I want other veterans to know that hope is possible through something as basic as writing down your thoughts, perhaps just sharing them with others, anyone who is willing to listen with empathy. It can help 
you to live and enjoy a fuller life. Here are a few other photos I took in Vietnam. This is a typical road scene leading into Saigon. I was standing behind the 50 caliber machine gun while we drove into Saigon. Another of my favorite photos. <laughs> that a war was going on isn't obvious in this picture. I completed my year in Vietnam and returned home on leave when I was 19 years old. Like so many other Americans through so many decades of our wars, <clears throat> I suffer from a non-physical injury. You can't see it, and I hope you don't notice anything different about me in my day-to-day -day activities. Like so many other veterans, I'm living out my life thankful that I was spared. There were several times that I'm aware of when I might have been have received serious injuries or died. I'll never know the number of times when I was shown mercy. On another day in time, the VC ambushed us again at different map coordinates. This time, a bullet hit me in the leg, and within five minutes, a large piece of shrapnel from an airstrike bomb fell from the sky and landed on my chest. I'd rolled over to reach another magazine <laughs> for my M16, and suddenly it plopped down right in front of my eyes. I picked it up, but it was red hot. I tried to pick it up. It's about the size of my little finger and has razor sharp edges all around. I used my shirt to flip it on the ground. When things were quiet and it was cool enough to touch, I picked it up along with the bullet. I brought both of them home as souvenirs. I have them with me today, if anyone wants to see them. So what did PTSD shove into my life? For starters, not counting the sad thoughts and memories that persist during my visits into the past, I continue to carry with me a revulsion to sudden, unexpected, loud noises and being near large crowds of people with their vast storehouse of intense energy. PTSD brings me an ongoing need to distance myself from getting to know people at a diff deeper personal level, at a depth where close friendships may develop. I call this condition my emotional poverty line. My first marriage after Vietnam lasted four and a half years. I couldn't get to know my wife on a personal level and we went our separate ways. My second marriage lasted 13 years. We have two children, both in their mid-30s. I was getting better at sharing my emotions, but I still wasn't where I needed to be. Now, my third wife and I have been together for 25 years. And it looks like it's going to continue into the distant future. These days, I'm, I'm somewhat better at sharing my emotions. She understands me, and in her unconditional way, she puts up with me. But I'm still trying to improve. She makes me want to be a better person. <clears throat> I truly believe that my life follows an unusual path, and in my case, it's for the better. First of all, I don't follow sports, and I stay away from large crowds. I prefer to attend and frequent the following. Art museums here in the US and in Europe, cathedrals of all sizes for their history and architecture, symphonies, and when possible, we enjoy dining, table for two, in uncommonly good restaurants. We like to investigate tide pools and sit beside peaceful mountain lakes. Occasionally, we'll find an airy with a breathtaking view and a paucity of other humans, a great place to meditate. I need and enjoy lots of quiet time. When ensconced in such an environment, I absorb and assimilate my surroundings, and that's when I like to write. I spend 25 to 30 hours per week writing or editing stories. 
Now that I'm retired, it's what I do. Without the time for creativity, I'd be lost. I'd have to find something to replace it in my daily routine or perish intellectually. We all have our favorite things, be they obsessions, preoccupations, or fascinations. For me, writing is my choice of options. Through the years, I've had numerous hobbies and pastimes, but only through the creativity of writing do I approach greater nullification towards my biggest quest, facing PTSD and diminishing its frequency of returns in my daily life. Through the years, I've written all of my various stories for myself. I'm pleased to find that others find them interesting. In my life, I've owned three automobiles. As a child, I spent weekends and summers with an aunt and uncle in rural Indiana, where I started driving when I was 11 years old. <laughs> I bought my 1988 Ford Ranger new, and I'm still driving it. I had it painted <laughs> and the engine rebuilt recently. <laughs> I don't believe in waste of any kind. I don't like to give things away either, but in this life, sometimes it's the best thing to do. I realize that uncounted numbers of military people from both genders suffer from PTSD in one form or another. None of us ask for it, <clears throat> want it, or know how to lose it. I believe that when one possesses acceptable material security, while being physically and psychologically equipped to face society, such a combination is paramount to establish an optimum quality of life vis-a-vis -vis PTSD. Let us strive for all military personnel who suffer from PTSD to achieve such mastery in their own lives. They deserve the reward of lifelong peace now and forevermore. There is no need for me to speculate of how my life could have diverged had I not gone to Vietnam. At the time, I felt it was the proper and noble thing to do. I never felt real fear except for a few times when bullets were flying and others were dying. My greatest fear came during my last two weeks in Vietnam. As incredible as it sounds, I'd always felt that I'd survived unharmed physically. Here's what happened during my last two weeks that brought me real heart-pounding fear. Along with two others, I had to go 100 yards outside our base camp perimeter in a jeep and wait at a landing zone. Our colonel was to arrive in his helicopter. We were about 75 yards from a quiet river that flowed slowly eastwards. Before we departed the orderly room, our sergeant told us, the intelligence officer, told me that there may be a few small boats with VC floating down the river. They'll be transporting rifles and maybe some ammo. If you see anything, call the colonel on the radio and tell him not to land. That was when it hit me. I've got two, two weeks left, and I'm going out there to do what? What made matters worse, it was 10 p.m. and a full moon illuminated the night sky. We'd be on higher ground above the river and in plain view. It was much darker on the river and tall foliage hid the embankment we'd be near. Believe me when I say it was a time and place where I didn't want to be. We went to the landing zone and waited in silence for the colonel to arrive. Then we received a radio call. The colonel would be 20 nerve-wracking minutes late. Fortunately that night, we saw no VC. Colonel landed, we all went back inside the wire. Then, from then on, I counted the hours until it was my time to go home. Thousands of Americans departed Vietnam with PTSD and most of them didn't know anything about it. Yet, it mattered not whether a service member had been drafted or had enlisted or if he or she had already served in the military for years. Once the damage was done, the die was cast. Many people believe our souls, or spirits, or whatever term you use, are on earth many times. 
In each visit, we are here to learn new tasks and grow in a spiritual sense. I'm not referring to the Sunday school sense of the spirit and the afterlife. I'm speaking of a universal knowledge, a unity, and it might be behind our being born on this planet. We also must find our own depth and breadth in this life. For many years, for many, an afterlife in one form or another makes the journey seem more believable. I'm outside of typical sleeping quarters at Bearcat, our main base camp. The shelter held 12 to 14 men who slept on individual army cots covered with mosquito netting. I hope that I've presented to you some useful information about me and how, after Vietnam, PTSD changed my life in the following ways. I avoid large crowds and loud noises, and I strive to know people at a personal level. In the past 45 years, I've managed to conclude two responsible careers, and I travel extensively. I continue to meet many people along the way, and through decades of employment, I've already met a few thousand others. I strive to maintain my own form of mainstream living while I attempt to transform and enrich my life. For me, living with a principle of willfulness while I strive for personal improvement along the way offers challenges I'd otherwise miss. I've not been the perfect husband or dad but I've always tried to be with what I hoped was the best action or response at the time. I'm better than I was 48 years ago when I returned from Vietnam, and I'm not as good as I'm going to be as time goes by. If there is such a thing as a book of life, and I get to read mine someday, I know I'll find my share of regrets I'll owe several people apologies of one sort or another. When all is said and done, how I've personally coped with PTSD works for me. I didn't want to take medications for the rest of my life, and so I chose not to. Luckily, I've survived to talk about it. Not everyone wants to write their most personal thoughts on paper as a stress outlet. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that on a daily basis. If my message to other veterans convinces but a few, I hope they'll try writing as a method of relief. It may make all of the difference in the world within their own lives. In the process, they may turn the corner and discover a new channel of release for their old memories and thoughts, the ones no man or woman should have to endure. I wish them the best in their lifelong quest. <clears throat> this aircraft and other like it was known as a Freedom Bird. The government chartered various civilian airlines to take troops to and from Vietnam and when they went on R&R, &R, which was five to seven days of relaxation away from the war. Every American in the war longed for the day when he or she would board one of these aircrafts to return home. In October 1968, on my final morning in Vietnam, minutes before my flight from Saigon lifted from the runway, I noticed a soldier seated a few rows behind me. We made eye contact. I stood up, smiled, nodded my head, and saluted him. We'd been in infantry training together at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and had lost contact in Vietnam. <clears throat> I remembered him as quiet and reserved. Five minutes later, when the plane was barely off the ground, he yelled out for all to hear, Gentlemen, the war is over. I can still hear him in his southern voice saying those words. Every soldier on the loaded plane yelled and clapped his hands. All of us, us had survived a year we'd never forget, in oh so many ways. 
1993, my wife, daughter, and I visited Washington, D.C. to see the sights and for me to see the Vietnam Memorial for the first time. I didn't make it into the parking space a half a block away before my eyes teared up. It was all I could do to control, somewhat, my emotions. My wife and I returned to Washington in October of 2015, and we took these last three pictures. This is the Three Soldiers Memorial at the Wall, with typical infantry uniforms worn and weapons carried in Vietnam. Many of the troops were 18, 19, or 20 years of age. A few steps away from the Soldiers Memorial is the Nurses Memorial. Two nurses are depicted attending to a wounded soldier while a medevac helicopter approaches. On this second visit, it struck me how my reactions this time were so different. On the first visit, I carried raw emotions that I'd held inside for 25 years. On the latest visit, I'd worked through the worst of my memories. <clears throat> Here's a photo of me taken last October 2015. It was a rare moment at the wall when pedestrian traffic was slow. I'm pointing to Michael's name. It was my special time for quiet remembrance. The wall is the most visited monument in Washington. More than 2.7 million US military personnel served in Vietnam. More than 58,000 Americans died during the war. More than 303,000 Americans were wounded. Of those, 153,000 were hospitalized. As of March 24th, 2016, 1,622 Americans are still missing, and unaccounted for in Southeast Asia. Direct U.S. military involvement ended on August 15th, 1973. Freedom comes with a price, but why do so many combat service members pay their portion for the rest of their lives. The world needs an alternative to war, and find it we must. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. When and how did you come to realize you had PTSD? When I was released from the Army in January 1970, I immediately went to Miami, Florida to go to college. I entered college. I was studying something that was brand new back then. It was called computer programming. And while I was in school, I, I realized it wasn't so noticeable to me when I was still in the Army because when I came back, I had 17 months to go. I went to Fort Meade, Maryland because a lot of other fellows were in the same situation. Sometimes we just stayed to ourselves a lot, but I, I, did, I felt that I didn't blend in with the others. I, I didn't run around with other people. I had a car. I could socialize, but, but I didn't. And I stayed the semester, but I didn't go back. And even when I returned home, I, I was noticing that um, Things bothered me, and I, I just didn't want to be around other people because uh, I, I just didn't feel that, that uh, it, it would work out. So I didn't. So it, I, I noticed it a little when I was back from the Army, but mostly when I was back in civilian life. So then you sought treatment of some sort? Or? Um, no, I, I, I didn't go to the VA for Oh, it was a good two and a half years. And uh, they, they gave me Valium, which they were giving everyone by the bucket full. And uh, I took Valium for, oh, I don't know, three months. I'd take Valium during the day and, <laughs> and drink whiskey at night. <laughs> I didn't stay awake often when I was at home. But, but after a while, I said, I don't need this. So I, I threw the Valium in the trash, and I, I just stopped going. But I, I wanted to improve myself, and, and I've been working on that ever since. Yeah. How many years after you returned from Vietnam were you able to 
tell your story to someone? Um, Oh, it, it was it was those two and a half or three years before I went to the VA. Uh, they they had counselors there that I, I I spoke with. I I went at first. They thought I was bad enough where they had me going five days a week, <laughs> but then then they cut it down to three days a week, and and it finally it was down to two days a week. But uh, after three months or so, I just thought, well, they're they're not going to help me anymore. So that's when I threw those. Are you still in some sort of therapy? No, no, no. No, that was that was years ago. Uh, I uh, I went for a while. Um, after I retired in, in San Diego, we moved to Montana, and I was up there for a while and decided that I, I want to go back and talk to somebody. So I did for a couple of months, and but it's been years. But I I wanted to to work through this myself, and what I've discovered is, is what's helped me the most is is writing this story, and and editing and and, uh, and talking to people about it. Yes? Um, how did you decide that writing was the best, best method for you? I like to write. And, and when I have something inside that really wants to get out, then I let it. And, and that's what um, spurred me on to, to write this particular story because uh, I, I just, one morning I woke up and, and uh, that was the story I had to write. Do you ever get an opportunity to go to you know, VA hospitals or somewhere, and then actually speak directly to veterans who are struggling right now with PTSD or whatever it may be. From um, Afghanistan and Vietnam. The the opportunity is there, but I've not looked into that. I give my card. I work at the VA. Okay, you you in Prescott or here in here, in right here locally? Okay, all right. Sir, were you in Vietnam or? No, I'm a Vietnam era veteran. My, uh, at the time that I was about to go in, because back then they were, the draft was still on. I know I don't look that old, but um, yeah, the draft was going on, and I had two brothers at the time, so my mother actually wrote Congress. So I would have to go to Vietnam, meaning that she would have had three sons yes. in Vietnam at the same time. So I'm a Vietnam era veteran, but not a Vietnam combat veteran. Mm -hmm. But I do. Um, I do facilitate groups at the Phoenix VA for PTSD, bipolar anxiety, depression, in a, in a program we call the PRRC, Psychosocial Rehabilitation Recovery Center, basically trying to get veterans who are severely mentally ill, severe PTSD, uh, get them to reclaim their lives. So and it's very interesting. And I think you'd be fantastic coming down and speaking to some of our vets mm. who are seriously struggling. Thank you. I'll, I'll talk with you then once we're concluded here. Sure. Good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sir, in two years I'll be a second lieutenant in the Army and I want to branch infantry. What uh, advice would you give me? If that's what you want to do, it's a great choice. It's a good choice for you. Um, just have have your buddies around with you. Watch watch everyone's back and stay close together and, and uh, just do what needs to be done. Um, you're you're in ROTC now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, s stay with it. I, I looked into that when I was in Miami and I didn't stay with that, of course. But but uh, it, it's a good way to go and and it, it's a great career if you want to stay with it for a long time. I, I still think the military is a, a great way to go for people out of high school or even with some college because you can, you can gain a, a career and once you're back in civilian life you can, you can work with that. Um, I've had two VA loans to buy houses. I had money to go to college from the VA. So I'm, I'm not down on the military at all. Um, it, it's, those organizations are, are vital and they're, they're necessary and I, I think they're they're great, but um, I've had my experience here with Vietnam and the Army and all, but I, I wouldn't uh, try to discourage anyone that's not already joined the military to not do it. Any other? Yes. So you're <clears throat> talking about writing about your experiences after, after the fact. Um, I don't know how feasible it would have been, but are there, did you or any of your friends try to actually write anything in the field? 
or short poems, you know, something that, that might have been stressed um, at the moment? A lot has been written that's available. I don't know those authors. Uh, I don't know the story behind when they generated that material. I don't know of anyone personally who did. I didn't. Um, the only writing I did and most of the other fellows were just letters to home. Um, but, but there's a lot of, there maybe a couple of thousand books out there at least uh, available that fellows have, have written about their times in Vietnam. Well, in the era of Twitter and all of that, mm -hmm. I just wonder if, you know, if somebody did a study of, is that even allowed to be used in the military today and how do they do it to um, relieve their stress? I, do, we, do we have anyone here? You're, you're, are you, have you been on active duty at all? Uh, no, sir. Oh. Um, what, what have you heard? What have they told you, the ones that have been in Iraq and Afghanistan? Do they use all the methods that are available for the media? Well, they use um, what they call it. Uh, I'm a little old-fashioned, but uh, um, Skype or something like that. But they, in terms of Twitter and all the other stuff, I haven't heard anybody come back and talk about mm -hmm. it. All I've heard about is emails. Things like that in the middle of a, mm -hmm. of a combat zone. I, I don't think you're really thinking too much about that. I really don't. Mm -hmm. And none of the veterans I've spoken to ever mentioned anything of that nature. So I wouldn't know. Um. Okay, yes. Oh, so my brother's in Afghanistan right now at the moment, and uh, to communicate with us, instead of even writing letters or something, uh, like he says Skype, uh, usually he uses like Facebook Messenger, and uh, it's pretty, uh, how do you say, it? it's pretty consistent, so he can call me at any time he has, any, if he has downtime, he'll mm. the video and I can talk to him directly, it's, mm. so it, it's helped a lot. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, it depends on your mission, what, where you're actually stationed and what your mission is. Of course, you want to disclose information of where you're actually located, depending on your mission. But most most um, social networking is available, and you can make it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's so prevalent that it seems that, that younger people would use that. I, I know guys my age I don't think would, if, if, but uh, <laughs> I don't even own a smartphone. <laughs> I have the old flip phones. I got, I got the flip phone, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? In retrospect, uh, can you think of anything that could have been done while you were at war or that could be used now while people are at war to help minimize or, or prevent the, the PTSD from developing to the I think when I was in, it wasn't discussed. Uh, what the Army knew about it at the time, I don't know. But we were just supposed to, to buck up and, and uh, just be men about it. Because th this sort of thing has happened, I believe in World War I, it was called shell shock. Um, I'm not sure, you, you know what it was for World War II? Um, pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Battle fatigue. Battle fatigue. Battle fatigue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, back then, I didn't know anyone, and there, there were guys that were bothered as much as I over there, but no one talked about it, and it, it just, we would have come out later on once they were civilians again, but that was, I think, the, the key to part of the big problem was because it was just swept under the rug, and, and uh, people came back and then had the problems. in different ways and different people, you know, according to, you know, what your uh, situation was and, and where you were at. Um, you know, a lot of times people think that you can, that you, you have to be in combat to uh, have PTSD, and that's not the case. Any traumatic event that happens to you in your life, it could be a car accident, and you get PTSD from it. I, I know I was in a car accident many, many years ago, and uh, somebody hit me, and his car came right inside my car. And for a long time, I could not, I mean, that's when I would go to any street, I would slow down immediately. And of course, I was constantly thinking, dreaming about this car coming inside. So, I, it just, it doesn't matter, I believe, that, well, you can't control, that's the depth of it. Because you don't know when it's going to, you know, actually rear its ugly head, it's going to come at you. 
And, and, and when it does, I do suggest that you get some. You're very fortunate, by the way, Mr. Stephanie, uh, uh, because I, I deal with some veterans who are seriously struggling to the point where they won't leave their homes. You know, they isolate, and that's when I go to their houses, you know, to do a welfare check on them, just to check up on them and find out how they're doing. All the lights are out, all the blinds are drawn, and, you know, they're, they're at the ready at all times. So I don't think it's it's any. Once you get into especially a, a combat zone where people are shooting at you, you know, uh, you're watching. One minute you're talking to your friend, and the next minute his head may be gone. You know, but for a long time it may not affect. It it will affect you right away, but then you don't know when it's going to come back up years later. And it does do that. It's it's something that you never know when it's going to come up. And but when you want to seek some, some, some yes, sort of help. It, it isn't. I, I want to reiterate what he said. It isn't just people in a war situation. It's any anything that's traumatic in a person's life could manifest itself for years, or maybe never leave. Well, I, I think he could have more to say than I would. But I think the, the family has to become involved and, and let the person know that they they want to help and listen to whatever they the, the person wants to tell them and let them know that they're there for them. Yeah, there's something called a wellness recovery action plan that's that we utilize at the VA where we may bring the family members in and they can, you'll get to know that's when you notice changes in that family member and that's when you would talk to that person and uh, you know try to get them, let them know, you know what? You may need to go down and, and talk with one of the therapists down at the hospital or, you know, make that call because uh, there's all different things that, that a family member, a lot of times you don't realize what's going on, but it's happening at that time. And that's the time that you want to get that veteran, you know, someplace where they can get some help and seek some help. But it's really about education. It's really about the family member, you know, uh, becoming really aware of what's going on with that person. You know, that's with a spouse. I think it's it's paramount that you know what's happening with them. And so many, uh, we find so many uh, husbands and wives and spouses who are afraid because the veteran, you know, will at that at time, they can jump up late at night or, uh, that's Mr. Steffi mentioned, uh, noises and things like that. That's a loud noise could set that person off. There's so many different triggers that could, arise that can set the veteran off and it would be advantageous for the family member to recognize what's going on and seek help at, at that time. Yes. I also think it's important to um, validate the individual's feelings and emotions and how they react instead of saying, you're so strong, you can get through this, or you should be this way, or I know you were so de independent before and I know you have it within yourself. I think that's one of the, sh the hardest things once you get out um, is dealing with that. Is like you're honored for so many years and you're seen a certain way for so many years and then you're struggling inside with these emotions and these feelings and everybody looks up to you and everybody wants you to be strong, everybody wants you to be this person and you don't, you can't, you don't have it in you. Right, you're not that type of person. You're not that so then you have to validate the person's feelings and what they're going through. Are you a veteran then? Yes. 10 years in the Air Force. Deployed? Yes. Do you utilize the VA at all? Yes. I actually work in CRC. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, okay. Down there with Melissa? Yes. I know exactly who you work with. Oh, okay. Good. And you do also get some therapy, right? Yes. All right, because I noticed some things just now, so I just wanted to check with you. Okay. Good. I'll give you my card before I leave. I'm wondering, in the era that you served, of course, uh, a higher percentage of the population was either serving or subject to serve, or you know that that potential was out there in ways that it's quite different now. Even in terms of just the sheer number of people who served in Vietnam, let alone during that era, uh, in compared to you know today's military. And I'm wondering in terms of, um, you know, PTSD in particular, whether your your peers of that era 
now but also at the time, in a sense, was there a broader spectrum of people who sort of understood or, or you're suggesting you were sort of isolated or isolated yourself so that didn't really get talked about? I'm, I'm just assuming that today they're even sort of a smaller cohort in terms of, of that. And again, you may be able to weigh in on that, but so many more served in that era. I'm just wondering if there was a larger cohort or if, like you're saying, if sort of everyone withdraws into themselves, then you're not really talking to each other. Is that, is that the case with you? I think there, there are groups around where fellows get together. Uh, um, I joined a, oh, three group, maybe four groups on uh, Facebook where we fellows are sharing with each other and uh, giving encouragement and that sort of thing. But I think many of the fellows when I was in had the same <laughs> attitude that I did. <laughs> just just uh, live with it and uh, you'll, you know, maybe you'll get over it, maybe you won't, but, but don't, don't be a whiner about it and, and just keep it to ourselves. But now that, now that the VA is um, looking for fellows to come in to, to, to help them, and, and the word is out on that. I think a lot more. Haven't they seen a great influx in the last two decades of yeah, well, veterans? Yeah, the whole thing was, was see, now you got to remember that the Vietnam veterans, that's when, that's when they came back. They were, you know, ostracized. They were, eggs were thrown at them. They were, you know, everything that was negative in this country, as well as in, in Hollywood, if you notice all the movies, Rambo and all that thing, oh, that's all the other movies had to have something that, had to have a Vietnam veteran that's involved. You know, if it was a, a mental health condition, it was a Vietnam veteran. If it was this, it was a Vietnam veteran. And they blamed the Vietnam veterans for losing the war. And all they did was go over, you know, unconditionally and, and do what they were asked to do. So it was a lot less that came in back then, even though you had a lot of them that uh, went over and a lot that were actually killed in Vietnam. You had a lot less that came forward because they did not Mr. Steffi pointed out that there was, for a very long time, he wouldn't have nothing to do with any kind of military, any kind of government, anything, stayed away. And a lot of veterans, Vietnam veterans, did the same. Um, today we have homelessness amongst the Vietnam veterans is, that's the largest group of homeless veterans out there right now, the largest group. And, uh, but they do have a veteran stand down, that's every year it's down at the, the fairgrounds, and you know everybody's welcome to come and do some volunteers. It's a great three-day event, and they have over a hundred different providers, almost like a one-stop shop for everything that that the veterans would need. You know, they even allow you to you know take showers, get haircuts, all all these things. And but there's still a lot of Vietnam veterans who who are out on, on the street right now and who won't come to the VA. And that's what we're trying to change that culture especially at the Phoenix VA, because I'm sure everybody's heard all different types of stuff. We're always in the newspaper. Don't believe all the hype, by the way. All right? Um, just to let you know, it's a, it's a lot of political stuff going on there that has nothing to do with, you know, actually servicing the veterans. But um, there's a lot less. And But, you know, the, that's the good thing is that because, of, and I hate to say this, but the younger veterans who are coming back from Afghanistan, from Iraq, it's because of them that a lot of the services that are now there have been popped up, uh, that are now um, uh, there. So this way, a lot of the veterans, including Vietnam veterans, and we even have some World War II vets who, you know, I, I have a, a 86-year-old gentleman that's in my program, World War II, and, uh, you know, still struggling from at what they called uh, back then um, battle fatigue or uh, you know, so, and great guy, but he's still struggling. So, I, I think it was a lot less back then that actually came in and, and sought help because they didn't want to have anything else to do with the military. Last questions? Yes. Um, is most of what you write related to your experiences in Vietnam? You mean my other books too? Yeah. No. No, it's just this one. I, I've not thought of, of adding any other books to it as, as Vietnam stories, as of right now anyway. But my, what other books I've written are, are different subjects, from, from aviation to relationships to travel. So. Mr. Stibbe, I, I got to add one more thing for, you know, for the veterans who are in here who have, 
boy struggling. Um, there's a place in Scottsdale, I don't know if anybody's heard of it, it's called the Franciscan Renewal Center. Yes. All right, if you've heard of it, in May, uh, a gentleman from South Africa is coming in. He actually runs what they call the Healing of Memories. I, I can show him the cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah okay. And, and, and it's basically about healing of memories through telling your story. And it's for vets only. Um, they actually cover the cause. It's a three-day retreat. It is a fantastic, fantastic uh, time to, you know, actually get some of your story out. And, and you're going to be telling your story to other veterans. You know, and his name is, and Google him, his name is Father Michael Lapsley. Um, he is uh, a freedom fighter from South Africa. He was actually um, part of the African National Congress. Um, is it African National Congress? Yes. That's right, the ANC, uh, with Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And uh, three months after Nelson Mandela was released from prison, um, the government of South Africa, they had already banished him from South Africa. I think he was in Zimbabwe or about one of the countries over there. And they sent him a letter bomb. And it blew off his arms, blinded him in one eye. And, uh, you know, he's, I, I actually got an opportunity to sit down and break bread with him. And like he told me, he said, Rob, I could have went one or two ways. You know, I could have got angry, you know, and I wanted revenge and this, that, and the other. But he went the other way. And this is a worldwide program that he runs. He travels all over the world. He, he is literally coming back in May. To, he's going to be there facilitating that particular retreat. I would definitely suggest, if you're having some issues, that as a veteran, that's, that's one of the retreats that you want to attend. When Do you know the here. dates of that? Um, yeah, I can get it. I didn't bring it with me because I really didn't expect to be talking. So I can post it for yeah. my students. Yeah, I will. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave my, uh, that's my email, or you give me your email. Thank and you. I'll leave, email the, uh, that's the dates to you. But it's, I've been there, that's myself, because I also suffer from PTSD, even though I wasn't in combat. Um, and um, I've been to the retreat twice, and he always, um, the gentleman that actually, uh, facilitates the uh, thing from America before the Father Michael gets here. You know, because I'm always sending more and more veterans. And I think they've serviced over close to 5,000 veterans since, since they've been coming here to America. So it's, it's a great, great retreat. And I would suggest it for anyone, you know, any veteran, because they actually are going to pay for it the entire time. Oh, and by the way, the food is fantastic. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Thank you very much. I'd like to have Mr. Stuckey uh, mention his book. All right. I think this fellow, okay, you have a question? Um, what was it like to live through a time period where a draft was happening? Mm -hmm. yes, like, what was the... I didn't give it a thought because I joined. When I was home on leave, I'm trying to think, I don't know if it was a, maybe I'd been in for two years already. But I would stop, I was at home and I said, when would you have called me? And they said, oh, about a year ago. So I wouldn't have escaped, but I was just ready to go and I just signed up and away I went. Uh, but as an only child and a male only child, would you have been drafted? Yes. I thought there were rules as to like who was excluded or something. I think if a family has lost other children, then if there's a remaining child, they I don't know, you, would you be stateside? Is that how they work that? They, they would more than likely keep you stateside. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't send you into the zone. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But it's not just an only child because I, I, uh, a, a friend from high school looked into that because he thought he wouldn't have to go, but he was drafted. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll tell you something else. Uh, this is Debbie, you were telling the gentleman down here who's ROTC, you know, how, that's how great the career is. And yes, it is a career. My viewpoint on it, you know, because I hear a lot of people, you know, who really don't know too much about the freedoms that the veterans have afforded folks. And a lot of times you may run into uh, someone in, that's in the street who may be dirty and nasty and this and the other, and it could be a veteran. And, and, and you don't know, and you don't know what that veteran did for you, for you to have the freedoms that are afforded to you. So, I mean, it's, it's always been my belief that you know, everybody should serve two years. I think in Israel, 
You got to do. Mm -hmm. Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody has to do two years worth of service. That's just my view, you know. But I think that that would be something to cook. So this way, you know what it, what it's like to, not just to be given freedom, but to earn it. So, it's character building. Uh, well, I want to thank you for the thank questions, you. and I'll, I'll show you that this is the cover of my book. You, you saw it on the screen. I have a few copies over here. They're $5. There's some other pictures over there you might want to see, and those two uh, paintings are over there, too. And on, on the paintings, it was when you were there, it was the woman whose photo you took who, if I have the chronology right, that gave the, the paintings, or? I'm, I'm going to say... I'm going to say what Ernest Hemingway and a few other authors have said. I'm going to leave that up to the reader's imagination. Okay. Yeah. But I did bring these paintings back from Vietnam. They're, they're there on the table. So. Some other photos and the shrapnel. Yes, the bullet and the shrapnel are there too. But. Well, thank you very much for attending this. And thank you. Thank you.